So it's the Hallmark holiday, uh, better known as <coughs> Valentine's Day, but uh, actually better than that, you know what day today is in the church calendar. Where's, where's, where's your dirty foreheads? <laughs> yeah, we, I, there's nothing wrong with that to be reminded that we're moving into the Holy Week. We're moving towards the Holy Week. Um, we're doing that at church in John as well, aren't we? I would like to, if you had turned in your Bibles to John 15, I don't know, can you guys all see that over here? Yeah, maybe I should, John, uh, Fred told me I should put it up on the stage, and uh, it's hard to get it up there, but John 15 is where we're going to go. We're going to probably look at verse 14 and following, so if you could find that in your Bible. This is the section where Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches. And I thought, this is not an epistle, but let's see if some of the things that we have read about this last week, we could apply even if it's not an epistle, but it's actually one of the Gospels. We're going to visit the Gospels in one of the chapters coming up, but let's see if we can use some of the skills we are being taught in the chapters that we've already read. So this is where Jesus is talking about being a part of the, you know, the, your vine and the branches. And if you're a branch that's connected, what are you getting? You're, you're getting the flow of living, uh, you know, stuff. The, the Lord, if you're staying plugged into the, into the Lord, the very lifeblood is going from the Lord to you, right? And he's doing this awesome teaching. And then he comes to verse 14, which is absolutely astonishing to me that as we learn in John chapter 1 Jesus did what with creation what was his role in creation he was the creator like John says there is nothing that you can see that he didn't make there's nothing that you can experience in all of creation that Jesus didn't speak out of nothing into existence and in John 15 verse 14 <laughs> I don't have it on my Bible yet, so I'm still flipping there, but um, you'd think I'd be better prepared. And you, should, you should have a better teacher than me, I think. Um, John 15, verse 14. You, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, <laughs> you are my friends. Just stop right there. Could Jesus really mean that could that mean something to you and me sitting here in 2024 this this was only written you know i mean this is written in ad 50 something this gospel somewhere between 30 and 50 somewhere in there we don't know exactly but jesus says you are my friends are you and i in that context because he keeps going if you do what i command you are my friends i no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. You're my friends. Since I've told you everything the Father told me, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask uh, using my name. This is my command. Love each other. You are my friends. Friends, so does this still apply to you and I? How can we determine that? What, what can we apply here? Because as we read in the chapter, things in the Bible sort of fall into, in the epistles specifically, they fall into three categories. They fall into three categories in how they can apply to us, right? So we have... Um, we have to ask with, uh, with regard to one, uh, one main idea, which is contextual. Anybody know that word? Relativity? Is that, isn't that the word we have? Okay, so that's, that's the big idea there, cultural relativity. Okay, so that's, that's our guiding principle, and we have to ask which category does any passage fall into with regards to cultural relativity? Is it something that is still true today, 
So that's, let's call that, um, it's an exact match. So we'll call that exact. So we have exact matches of, 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 of a passage we read. Whatever happened in the first century, we have an exact match right now in 2024. So there's that camp, right? So we have, with res respect to cultural relativity, we have some things that are exact matches to the culture. He gives an example. Romans chapter 3, verse, anyone? 323, which says, you don't need Jesus. You're all good, right? How, as you are. Isn't that what it says? No, no. It says that you have all sinned and fallen short. If I had a big target and we were going to throw the dart based on your life and you threw your dart, your life was the dart, and Jesus goes, hey, where's your dart? <laughs> it didn't hit the board. You've missed. Okay, so an exact match is a, is a passage like Romans 3, 23. All have sinned. That was true back then, the culturally relative moment that it was written in the first century, right? And it's still absolutely true today. That's the first category within cultural relativity. We have to ask this about every passage. I'm asking it about John 15. Is the stuff that Jesus is talking about his disciples true of us today? I think so. So we need to read that like he's speaking it directly to us. We don't have to do any translation. No, now that, no, so, on the, so that's one side of this. So if this is a continuum, there's an arrow here on the left, and we draw an arrow uh, to the right under cultural relativity. So way over here is exact. And then if we go over here, I'm just going to write the word not. Not at all. Like doesn't have anything to do with us. If you were to read a passage in the Old Testament that talks about you going to sacrifice the, your first and best animal. How many of you have done that this year already? Have you, how many of you have gone to the temple and you've taken your best ram, and it was a male ram, and you sacrificially killed it on the altar outside of the temple? How many of you have done that? Nobody? Right, so that's a not. Like not, meaning there's not any. Th those are not going to, those are just like, we have no frame of reference for that. This chapter, does anyone remember what those, there's no reference for that? Slaves or food sacrifice to idols. That's another one that he talks about. You know, do you ask the butcher when you walk into uh, Schnucks, <laughs> hey, have uh, any of these uh, cuts that you put out there been sacrificed to a false god? Because I don't want to buy them if they have been, right? So that's... So I'm going to say idol worship um, from the specifics of idol worship. That, that's the not. But then, do you remember there's a third category? Well, it's, 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 it's the one that's kind of graves. You're not really sure. It's the extension category, he calls it, right? Can, um, can we call it extension? Sure. Let's call it extension. <laughs> and that's here. And so then, how, you know, down here we have our passage. And we're wondering, which one of these does our passage fall into, whichever we're reading? And guys, I'm telling you the whole chapter right here. Right? This is the whole chapter in a nutshell. There's three main categories. There's yes, there's no or not, and then there's the gray area. And where do we love to try and find uh, uh, places within? Do we like the yeses and the noes, or do we like gray? We love, we love gray. Yeah. We, we do. No, we, as, as, as Christians, we love gray. You know how I know that? Because that's where we fight about stuff. We really do, as Christians. That's, we must love gray, because that's where we fight over things. That's where we argue whether or not women should be teaching in church. And we, you know, he, he, uh, Paul, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. And then he writes in 1 Corinthians 12, and he's got all kinds of stuff in Timothy. And then there's chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. There's all kinds of things he's writing in there. But we'll fight about whether or not women should be silent in church. But we, you know, we'll say, well, that's what Paul says. That's what he says. See, it says it right there. 
but we failed to ask which, the question of which area does this passage fall into? Is it one that that's an exact, you know, we're, we're in the same spot with women in society as Paul was writing to the Corinthians or the Ephesians when he's writing to, when he's writing to Timothy? <clears throat> do, do, do you, how, how many women uh, here have a college education? Raise your hand. <laughs> Did you know that was not allowed? You weren't even allowed to learn to read? You weren't even allowed to testify in a court proceeding. You know why? Because women are hysterical, they're, they're second-class citizens, and frankly, you cannot be trusted. How many of you feel like that's true about you? No. Uh, how, many of you, how many of you would be able to, today, if you were asked to, to uh, be able to testify in a court proceeding? As a witness, would there be any question in our society? No, no, there wouldn't be. I mean, sometimes we have mitigating circumstances. The, if someone is, is not of their, you know, faculties aren't there or something, that, that, that's a different thing, but that's not gender related. That's cognition related. That's what is, what is your mental abilities and all of that. So how come we apply those things that really tend to fall in this extension gray area, and then we fight about it. And that, that, that really, I'm outside the pages of, of our chapter, but you know why I'm going there? It's because nobody's paying attention to how to read the Bible for all it's worth. We wouldn't get there if we did good exegesis, because that's where our chapter starts. Did you read that? It's like, man, we have to do good exegesis, and you thought that was the hard part? And well, you know, hermeneutics, that's going to be easy, right? Because we're talking about today. When in fact, what does our author say? It's actually way harder. And the reason I want to talk to you about it in this way is so that you see what I'm talking about. It's like, you can go to denominations where women aren't allowed to write books because a man might read them. And then if they learn something from your book, ladies, you've taught a man. And Paul says, women should not teach. Doesn't that infuriate you? It frustrates me. It's, it's taking and doing violence to this process that we're talking about. I, I, I just despise stuff like that. And, and the, I, I think we want to live in this gray area because this is where we fight all the time. Now, some things we think is exact, and some people will argue that it's not. That's a very much an exception. Most denominations are formed over arguing over this middle section. And sometimes, like women be silent in church, misappropriating a very occasional, remember that word from last week? The letters were written for a specific occasion. The letters are occasional. There is a reason for Paul writing them. He was writing because there was problems with a certain group of women in the church he was writing to, it was not universal. It fell in this, there is no direct thing here until we have issues with the way we're conducting ourselves in church. Then maybe something applies where we could use, it would slip over into the extension, right? And, and so our author says, when we're talking hermeneutics, Herman who, I mean, it said that in there, Herman who? When we're talking about hermeneutics, how do we apply the Bible for today? It's a minefield. It's a minefield. And now that I've started talking about this, are you suspicious that maybe there's been things that we've believed as churches for hundreds of years that may be way off? Is it possible for churches to get so far off that they're outside of a, a proper hermeneutic with respect to how we apply the Bible? We have to say yes because we're all sitting in a Protestant church right now, right? There was this guy who's nailed 95 theses on a, on a door. His name was Martin Luther. His last name wasn't King, I'm sorry, but his name was Martin Luther. And he was a Catholic priest who said, look, we've, we've got hundreds and hundreds of years of abuse here. In fact, even more than that, we have misread scripture in, and, and we need to reform, right? And so is this chapter opening up a world 
To us, yes. I don't want you to be intimidated. I don't want you to be run over by this chapter. It uses big words. I'm here to tell you that it, here's the three areas that any passage break down, especially, 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 did I say especially? Especially the epistles, because they are so occasional. They're so occasional. And so our author walks us through a very careful process of how we're supposed to read an epistle and then discover, wait a minute, this passage that I'm reading, where does it break down? And so we've really at length discussed these two, but this is the one I bet where everybody got confused, the extension one, because that's the gray area. That's where we have to apply our best common sense, our best wisdom, and, and take the longest and most care to make sure we're applying the scriptures in a proper way. Um, and that's where he, he talks about the, the basic rule is there are going to be things that happen back in the day, first century, when Paul's writing the letter, that are exactly the same as today, Right? But the first rule of that is that whatever he was saying to them in the first century, it can't mean anything other than that. Right? Remember that? First, the basic rule. Now, I want to submit to you that as a pastor, there are church denominations that break that rule because they haven't done this cultural relativity job and the exegesis well enough. And it's never too late to do the next right thing. So is it too late for us to try and figure out what the Bible is actually saying and, and live according to it? No. No, because Martin Luther isn't the only reformer. And it's not the only time that the church needs to be reformed. God gave us the Holy Spirit because he needs us to be reformed and always reforming. And that's not a theological position reformed. I mean, that means we have to reform our thinking according to what the Bible says and what it doesn't say. And so as we look at the basic rule, the text could never mean something that it could never have meant to its first century author and audience. If you would apply just that, just that one basic rule, you would find whole sections of teaching by the church that you're going, Wait a minute. I don't think, I don't think we're, we're quite following. I don't think we're following with good exegesis. So our very basis, our, our foundation is all off. And when a house's foundation is bad, Scripture says it's, a, it's shaky. It's not going to withstand the storms. And so the, that first basic rule, it can't mean anything beyond what it meant back then. And then the second rule is the, the idea that we have some exact things, like Romans 3.23, where we're the, same, we're the same context. The same things that they were dealing with back then is the same thing we're dealing with now. In fact, didn't Solomon talk about the fact that there was nothing new under the sun? Right? Even though in other places in Scripture... Uh, Paul says in Romans 1 that God gave the people over to their sinfulness. They even thought of new ways of sinning. Well, that's in context, right? I mean, they were applying sinfulness in ways that were just degrading and, and base and not, not good in Romans 1. So we've got those kinds of things going on. Then we have to look at the gray area of using extended application, where if we're reading a passage... Is it okay, even though we're not in the exact same area, can we extend, that's why we called it extension, can we extend it from that original context into the context we're in today? You know, can we legitimately talk about things like abortion? Because the scriptures really don't talk about it. The, the, the word abortion doesn't exist in an English equivalent in scripture. But how can we use principles and some contexts, contexts, plural, to apply to things like that? And <clears throat> we have to look at some basics like 
what does the Bible say and how does it respond to the taking of human life? From what I read, it's only God's purview that can take human life. When you read Leviticus, you're saying, wait a minute, Israel was told to take lives right and left. But was that really under their authority? Or was it under God's authority? When God said, take, if someone commits a sin that's so bad, you have to take their life. Well, that's a big deal. But taking of life from the Ten Commandments, we say, thou shalt not. Yeah. It's not, it's not just end someone's life, it's murder. And the idea of kill being murder. So the, if, we, if we say, well, God is very much against the taking of life, innocent life, we would start extending that to talk about abortion. Very, I, I can't believe we still argue over it, but that just tells me how deep our sin is in our society. Let's talk about homosexuality. How many of you have, don't have to raise your hands, but have a family member that you wish you could say that the scripture really doesn't say anything about homosexuality, that it's okay? Um, but it doesn't. There's a consistent witness within the scripture on this. Do I wish it were different for some people that are very important to me in my life? Yeah, I wish it were different. But it's not. No more is it different for husbands staying with their wives and not being with anyone else that's a female after they're married. God says no. I can't ever remember a time in my life where I didn't think girls were pretty. Always thought that. But I make a choice to be loyal to my wife every day despite every inclination that the sin might well up in me because that's what God's word says and I know that's what builds healthy relationships and that's how to honor my wife. Sometimes scripture says things, oftentimes scripture says things that are very difficult, that has a consistent message, yet society's working really hard to change that message, is it not? And, I mean, it's just one thing right after another. If we're not doing this job really well, it's easy to slip and, and, and get off the rails and lose, go outside the guardrails that I talked about, right? And so this extension piece um, is really, I think the author said it best. You get into trouble with extension when you ignore the first job you have, which is good exegesis. Good exegesis. You have to think about good exegesis as building that firm foundation that you can build an understanding of Scripture on, right? If, if, if you're a word picture person, exegesis is the foundation. That's pouring cement into the forms and letting it harden up so that as you build your belief, it gives you something to build on, right? So if, if your foundation is, is sketchy, it's, it's going to crumble. It'll, it'll end up being a, a fancy house of cards. And, and so um, there are many things that we can apply to ourselves in this study of scripture that we have to really be careful about. Um, so the problem of cultural relativity, there were guidelines that were given to us. And are they on page like 85 or something like that? There's four steps. Problems have the following four steps. And then there's guidelines to translate culturally relative teaching. And what page is that on? I thought it was 85. I didn't write it down, but I, I thought I remembered that. And so it, he starts with talking about, you know, some of, the, some of the difficulties, but then he gives some super great guidelines whenever you're in this gray area. Okay, do you see them there? They're actually numbered, aren't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so we have distinguished between the central core message and what is dependent on that core message or what's peripheral to it. So if you're in a gray area, you've got to ask yourself, wait a minute, is this the central teaching of that passage that you're trying to decide about? Is it the central point of the thing? Or is it kind of on the, on the edges? Or is it on the periphery? Is it, a, is it a tangential is my word for it. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here a little bit. 
And if it is, you have to be even more careful because if it's not a part of the core message. Or, you know, secondarily, how does it relate to the core message? So secondly, he says, distinguish between what the New Testament sees as inherently moral and what is not. He gives uh, homosexuality as the, there's an inher inherent morality to homosexuality all the way through scripture from start to finish. And there wasn't a different sexuality back then because it talks about the genital side of things. I mean, it talks about the physical act of homosexuality that's the issue. Even Romans, if you think about it, you know, they exchanged relations, natural relations with unnatural ones. Why am I harping on this? Because it's, it's a hot topic that we just seem to want to rehash and we want to bend scripture to something that many of us wishes was a little more wiggle room than there is, just so that, so that there wouldn't be such an issue with, with our society, which is getting way off track. So, so there's that consistent moral message. What is the Bible saying consistently about this extension area that we're in? Is, you know, can we find other places within scripture that talk about those same things since we're in the gray area? Does that make sense? Yeah. Where is there other witnesses to it? How can I read parallel passages that are dealing with the same, same issue? Okay. And, and then make special note of items uniform and consistent with the New Testament with witness and where it reflects differences. So this passage I'm reading, is it reflecting that core message or is it different than the core message? Then we have to ask, ask the question, why is it sharing something different? Women are a good example there. Why is it that it seems like in some passages you see women who are acting as apostles? They're, they're like apostles, and, they're, and they're, they're leaders of churches, and they're, they're, teaching, they're teaching in churches. They're the ones who are giving the message. They're proclaiming the word. It says they're prophesying. How, how do you have that in the New Testament witness? But then you have Paul saying, but women should remain silent. So when we're running away from the core message, why is that core message different? Why is it that this is discussing women differently than I've read in other areas of the, of the thing, of, of, of the scriptures? You know, Junia, her name wasn't Junius. That was a made-up name to, so that we wouldn't have a woman in the role that she was in. Frankly, as she's mentioned in scripture, just personal frustration on my part. Um, so a whole woman, a woman who was very vital in the early church, because men didn't want women to have high places because that didn't fit their narrative, just added an S onto the end of her name and made a name up so that she wouldn't, it would be a man's name rather than a woman's name. Is that frustrating to anybody? That really bothers me. So when there's different messages, how do we reconcile that? Why would Paul be saying something different? That moves you to a contextual discussion of what is there something going on with a particular group of women which we we know history tells us there were right it's a particular thing going on that paul's having to say look ladies zip it because of the situation right <clears throat> so then we need to distinguish between principal and specific applications determine the cultural options open to a new testament writer if it's one option that will narrow the application, like how, like how is this particular truth being applied by the author himself? And, and is, he, is he off of that core witness again in this instance? It's kind of saying the same thing. Um, we have to be honest that the number five, I think it is, or number, number six, keep alert to cultural differences between the first century and the 21st century. I think that's number six. It's like, it seems like no kidding, right? When you read that, you're like, of course. But the number of times that someone ignores and arrives at an improper application of scripture in my lifetime is, I, I, it makes me pop my lid. Because it's a simple thing. Wait a minute. You can't apply that to today. You can't, because it's different today. The culture of today does make a difference, but it's within guardrails. The guardrails of the central message of scripture will keep us 
from running off the edge of the cliff because we'll run into that guardrail and it'll scuff up our car, but we're like, oop, I need to get back to the center here. That's what a guardrail is for. It's there to wake you up. It does only a little bit of damage because it's going to save you from greater, you know, catastrophe, if you will. And so that number six, you would think that'd be easy. There's a difference between first century and today, but we forget that all the time. And then the last one, recognize that we need, and I thought this was the best thing that, to kind of finish this whole section off on, that word charity. Charity. You should circle the word charity in your chapter and draw an arrow through it and draw a rocket coming from it because that's what we need within the church is, is charity. Because too much of my own, I've spent too much time worrying about the fact my, my theology can beat up your theology. This is me. This is Tom Douglas. I've, I've exerted way too much energy fighting with someone over something. Usually because I feel like they're not giving me room for where I'm at, where, where I am in the moment. I, I'm not give it, being given the room to believe what I believe. And they're trying to sweep me off the Christian page. Usually that's when I get really frustrated and say things I wish I wouldn't have said and lose charity altogether and it, I, won't, I won't extend mercy frustrating but there's there, there is so much wiggle room within Christianity that's still inside the guardrails you, you know what I mean by that like I can be way over here and someone else that's a brother or sister in Christ can be way over there on the other side of, of, of the path or the lanes that we're in and we're headed in the same direction. So why are we arguing over this? And, and because we forget charity, we start to argue over this center section and don't realize that we've got so much of this over here on the exact and the not exact, no relation at all that we agree on. And we get this one little point that we want to argue over, and the next thing you know, everything blows up. And I can't fellowship with them anymore because, and then fill in that blank, they have to have King James Version. That was one that was pretty big when I was younger. It's still there in pockets, right? Another one that I remember when I was younger was the late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsey's book <laughs> on when stuff is going to happen. Well, it's going to happen on this date. I know it. That date passes. Uh-oh. Great, edition two of the late great planet Earth. You know, and he comes out, oh, man, I made a mistake. And, but people were dividing over that. How crazy is that when Jesus himself says, I don't know when I'm coming back. So I'm trying to give you examples of how not doing a good job with this really gets us in trouble. And I also want to make the case for you as to why I'm teaching this class, because it's that important for the body of Christ to realize that we are all planes flying in formation behind the one true king who's coming back and, and will finally settle all of this nonsense. We're all going to find that we have to have a, a bit of a change in our theology. You know, probably not me, but everyone else. <laughs> but, you know, that's okay. Oh, uh, yes. I just wanted to say, you know, when Temple Baptist and Mosaic started talking together about whether we were going to merge and how would that look and yep. would it fit, this was where we spent a lot of our time to begin with to see what do you believe, what do we believe, how, how important is, are these issues, what can we kind of agree to disagree about and what can we say no I'm not going to bend on this right Though they, these were conversations and discussions that we had yeah. at the beginning and to me this was the crux of it because we needed to be able to have our tenets that we believed in these things we could agree on these things and anything else like what the form of the music is going to be or you know those kinds of things could come afterwards and were, were secondary or Yep. Even less. Yep. But this was really important. And it was really, um, it, it got to be hard sometimes. I remember having conversations and there were some heated times and some like, well, I don't think this is going to work. And then we yeah. 
yep. talk about it and think about it and pray about it and then come back and then you would go forward yep. again. So yep. it, it, is, it is a really um, important thing, but it's also a hard thing because it presses you to see yeah. what do you believe and why, well, why do we believe that? Why is that in, yep. in the Constitution yep. or whatever? You know? What chips are we going to push into the center and which will we leave out here and say that's okay? Because we have to hold these things in common. So I want to finish our time by saying, um, can you tell this is super important to me? Yes. <coughs> Why? Because it will help us avoid, avoid conflicts that are unnecessary. If we're allowing this, understanding the cultural relativity and the thing that, that good exegesis has to consider so that we can have a discussion about how p particular passages apply before we move into that. And, and this is something that you can mm -hmm. comprehend. Do you comprehend it now, as I've described it? This idea of how to apply occasional literature, known as the epistles? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's this right here. And that if someone asks you to talk about what did you learn tonight, just draw this and say, we're gonna run into passages that are exactly relatable to us, despite 20 centuries or whatever it would be, you know, all those hundreds of years, and, and, and there's gonna be some that have no relation to us, and then there's gonna be these ones in the middle that we have to work even harder at to understand what it meant before we can talk about what it means. And that, that I want you to have the theological and biblical muscle to be able to have these conversations and to spend time with it. And so let's, let's roll back to John 15. And what are the implications of the fact that Jesus, the creator of the universe, calls you friend? What are the implications of that? You have value. You matter to him. He wasn't saying that in some offhanded, flippant way in John 15. He understood that he was speaking across centuries and that his guy John was going to put it down and you would have a copy of it and you would understand that Jesus, the creator of the universe, calls you his amigo. Right? How much value do you have in that? That no one can take away from you. And, and don't take a back seat, priest. You are all priests. You are a part of a royal priesthood. You, you have every right to take part in this kingdom today. Don't take a back seat to anybody. And if, if somebody tries to make you take a back seat because of, of anything, you tell them they need to talk to me. <laughs> and they need to read scripture. Because that's where I'm going to take them. And the enemy would love for you to doubt yourself. The enemy would love for you to not believe that you are genuinely one of Christ's friends and that he had you in mind when he hung on the cross. So how are we splitting up small groups tonight? Kind of Pete. Uh, we could touch base after. We could touch base afterwards. Oh. Okay. Sometimes that's better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Imagine that. Dan Gelvez has a question. No questions, Dan. <laughs>
orderliness in worship? That's a question. Yeah. 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 All right. For those groups who are back, did you have any other than Dan Galvez? Anybody have any questions? Yeah. He didn't even hear me, which is great. Oh. So anything confusing or, um, you know, the, we didn't talk a lot about matters of indifference because I, I kind of lumped it into the gray area, but you discussed that. Um, there, it's important to, to determine if something is a matter of indifference. How did Paul refer to something? He has different phrases that he'll use when it's something that's a matter of indifference. I thought that the, the text did a pretty decent job of discussing those issues this last week. Um, and Paul will typically say, you know, I don't have a leading on this, or this is from the Lord. He'll say if that really is a high priority thing that he knows is a, a matter of high, high priority and that it's one of those central teachings. But then there's other things that he just gives advice on. And they're, they're matters of, well, you can take them or leave them. It doesn't matter which, which way you go on them. Um, you know, I, I had somebody asked me at church last week. They were obviously reading ahead. They stopped me after church service and said, you know, this matters of indifference thing. What would be a good example of that? And the first thing that came to my mind was that Hal Lindsey discussion I did. Like, when Jesus comes back doesn't matter. I mean, we're, we're not going to divide over that because if you're right and I'm wrong, so what? We're both still going to the same place. And if I'm right and you're wrong, so what? We're still going to the same place, you know? And I have opinions about it, but I'm not going, I'm not going to the mat over stuff like that because whenever Jesus comes back, that's up to him. And if Jesus doesn't know but trusts his Father enough to not have to know, then I don't have to know. Because if Jesus doesn't know, does that mean I have to know? He has tremendous trust in his father which that's one of those things that i don't know if you've ever thought about it before but i have because i tend to think about things like this because of my stupid brain sometimes but the only source of true community that we know is the trinity the only source of true community that we know is the trinity father son holy spirit there's no envy there's no turf wars there's no wondering where they stand. There's absolute trust. And um, we're, we're supposed to be, re we're, we are reading this book for the Africa trip that asks the question, why did Jesus come? And that answer is great, easy for me to answer, and that is to glorify the Father. Why did he come? To bring, to bring glory to the Father. When the Father's the one that has the salvation plan, did you get, catch that as you read scripture? And Jesus is the execution of that salvation plan. And, you know, and when we're reading in John, my Lord, as he's praying, you know, John 17, we bring, you know, I've hopefully brought glory to you, now bring glory to your son. And in fact, I've already been glorified. That's the key to why Jesus came, that he might bring glory to the Father. And the true community that that reflects. You know, there's no hesitation in the Trinity. And that's, that's really the relationship that God had with man until the fall. Until the fall, there was true community between God and, and, and humans. And <clears throat> that's what God is restoring. And is that something to look forward to? And to pray that prayer, Lord Jesus, come quickly. So, uh, so the matters of indifference thing, I don't want to major there. I want to major on the majors and minor on the minors. You know, I know that that's one of the things that I was impressed with as a new elder, that the merger, you were kind of discussing some of that. I wanted to reaffirm that, that, that we tried to maintain those differences where there was charity and uh, unity, un unanimity, absolute unanimity on the stuff that we can't have any divergence on. Salvation, trinity how God created us, things like that. There's no wiggle room for that.
and there isn't amongst us. But other things, yes. So, any other questions that surface that maybe something that you really found yourself dwelling on a lot in your small group? We struggled with this. Um, the guidelines, the ones that you talked some about in the beginning, number five is just a part of the uh, Number five, <coughs> could you? That's um, page 87, I think it was. Yeah. It said uh, at the bottom of page 87. Determine the cultural options open to a New Testament yeah, writer? We, we didn't quite understand that. I didn't anyway. Right. So it's like when Paul's writing about women in the church. Um, what are the options available to him? Well, we can see options within Scripture. There's, I, I was talking about it. Like you have Junia, who is named as one of the apostolic leaders of the church. You have, uh, <coughs> frankly, you have Priscilla. It, it, is an, it is an extreme ancient Near East oddity that she's named first all the time. You know, if you read your scripture, it says Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla was the female. She was the one who became a Christian first. It's clear that she was a very predominant figure in the early church, wherever she was. It, was, it, was, it sounds like from the witness of her life, she was an itinerant preacher that that I, her itinerary was set by her business. Like wherever she traveled, churches popped up. Kind of like with Paul, he was a tent maker or whatever, and he went, but uh, Priscilla had, had a business, and you know she, she used that business to travel with, it would seem. So, but just even for the very fact that she was named first. So they, they've got that option for how you know, we see women in the New Testament. Paul could write that way, which he did, but then you have the, the church at Ephesus and some of the things you see in Corinth that Paul's saying about how women should be restricted as a result of difficulties within those churches. And so there's this range of how Paul can write about women. But then there are other things that Paul is just doesn't have a whole lot of wiggle room in. There's, there's not a lot of options to write in different ways about it. And I think that's mostly what that number five is saying is that what are the differences in the options and things that Paul, Paul could write in the epistles about? So it's another way to say how wide is this central extension gray area piece? How, how, how much wiggle room in a particular area that you're, you're reading on? Is there really? How much wiggle room do you see within the writings of Paul himself or maybe Peter or, or James? Uh, maybe the book of Hebrews, that's, it's a weird epistle, but it's an epistle nonetheless. Um, I like to push the ideal that the author of Hebrews was actually Priscilla. <laughs> uh, she has every uh, standard of that, that, you know, it's an argument from silence, but the reason that she's not named is because of the time she lived in. She put her name to it, no one would have paid attention. But that's just a private little thing for me. That's not necessarily to hang your hat on. Hey, let's start a denomination. Yeah, let's start a denomination over the fact, right. Right. Well, you have, you have just some really prominent women. I mean, look at even just how Jesus treated women. It was so countercultural, contra to his environment. Um, to, to not read Jesus with that aspect to his Teaching and, and walking his life is to miss a major part of what he was trying to show the kingdom is going to be like. Men and women have different roles. They have different things that they do. But that doesn't mean there's lesser or greater. Uh, so, lots of words. I guess must have, must have been a pastor in my life. <laughs> so, I don't know if that cleans it up or not, but that's some of what we're, we're needed to look at is What's the wiggle room on a particular topic and how we see it taught in scripture? Okay, anything else in those? The guidelines are kind of, it's, it's like using muscles for the first time that you didn't know you had. You know, when you do that new exercise at the gym and then sometimes it's, when you're younger, it takes you a day or two before you hurt. For, up, for those, of those of us who are a little bit further down the road, it's like 20 minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> that muscle hurts, but 
We're, we're using different muscles. We're, we're exercising our, our faith in ways that maybe hasn't been exercised before. And I, I love it that you have your own copy of the, the book in your hands because then you, you can reference chapters and things, you know, and I'm, I'm still going to be available after the class is over. And I don't have all the answers, but I'm willing to try and look for them for you. So other difficulties or things that you talked a lot about. Do you start to see that maybe some of the things that you've always held as truth in church may not be so solid in the way that you've believed them? It should call, I want you to kind of look back on your beliefs and, and, and apply this to them and how you've, you've looked at them. Not the core stuff, but Lord, reveal to me some things that maybe aren't exactly biblical. And the Protestant church has its own history that we sort of rely on, right? And... Why, why do you do communion? It's something that you do all the time, but is it something beyond that, and why? Yes, Wayne. Well, in my lifetime, I've seen a switch from the Old Testament wrath of God to the New Testament love and grace of Jesus. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so, so that's a big switch we've seen there. Switch to what? Is something different than that, or <laughs> that there's been a cementing of the Old Testament's a wrathful God? That's, yeah. okay, yeah. Yeah. As versus, uh, you know, now we're going to rule by the love and grace. The great heavenly grandpa yeah. of the New Testament? Yeah. <laughs> Who says, hey, come on over to my candy drawer and have some fun <laughs> things out of my candy drawer. And yeah, right. They're not reading Revelation. I think that's in the New Testament, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's a judgment seat there where there's sheep and there's goats. And, and there is no wiggle room, right, right. And, and it's not up to us, is it? Yes? We were talking about during the formation of the colony, Massachusetts was Puritan. Right. Now, Rhode Island was Roger Williams, so the Baptists, the Carolinas were the Episcopalians. Right. Or if you had the Catholics. Yep. Sort of smattered in between all of them. Thirteen colonies of unity with all the unity. Right. And that's, I mean, I think it was Max Lucado who was speaking at, um, remember when Promise Keepers uh, brought out the Pastors, Promise Keepers Conference that was held in Atlanta. I went to that. Max Lucado spoke at that. And his message was, oh, how we love to cluster. And the guy next to me says, and we create quite the cluster. <laughs> <laughs> He must have been a Marine or something, I guess. But, uh, but that whole idea that we love to cluster around our pet ideas and focus on this gray extension area rather than the stuff over here on the absolutely this applies side and then the stuff over here, we know this doesn't apply. And hopefully, as we embrace stuff like this, things like this book in our walk with Jesus, we start to see through that. And we, we disabuse ourselves of that. We remove ourselves from that kind of thinking. We, we move away from, from old ways, take off old clothing and put on new, as Paul says. And, um, and uh, you know, praise God for a church that values that. And I, I've said it several times when I said, hey, I, you know, I was, I was thinking about this book, Dave. Dave Spooner, and I said, well, I'm thinking about, wouldn't it be great if we had a little, somebody would teach that class, and he, you know what he said, yeah, yeah, you, 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 should, you should teach that class, that's a great idea, good job. <laughs> but I, I, is it strange that we've been together for four weeks already? Yeah. And if, if, have you looked at the section of the book that we've been through to this point? It's a good chunk, four chapters already. And so as we turn our eyes towards the Old Testament narrative, I would have you, there's like three or four 
uh, Bible project videos that are on um, setting and uh, various contextual things that you can watch that would be very helpful for you. Um, I, can't, I can't remember all of them. I think there are four of them that I, if I'm remembering right, and it's talking specifically about narrative, old, you know, biblical narrative. So go to the, your YouTube page and, and, and look up um, Bible Project and then add the word narrative in there and uh, like several will pop up and it's, it's going to give you more understanding that's a little broader than just the chapter. And I'll, I'll post one of those on the, on the group site, the chat. I'll, I'll post a link to one of those at least so you can kind of find them. Because when you look at one, it'll give you some of the other ones that kind of show on the right-hand side as you're watching the one so that you can kind of move through those. And they'll be helpful. It, I can tell you that it does some work on explaining things that will give you more of a, a handle on what we're talking about. And I'll, I have a... Um, there's a couple of books that I just love on narrative. He gave us stories is one of the titles. I'll post that as a resource. And then the art of biblical narrative um, is a, by Alter is a, another, it's very small. It's a great book. It helps you think about what do I need to be thinking about? What do I need to be having in mind as I'm reading a narrative? And uh, what, you know, what, what tools do I need? And that's what this next chapter has. Yes, Lee. Oh, okay. I just want to make, I, I didn't know if you're, yeah, I want to make sure I didn't miss you. Yeah, okay. So I guess we'll see you next week. We have Bibles over here that, did you restock? There's new ones you haven't seen yet over here. So, all right, guys, thanks for coming. See you, see you next week.